Hi everyone, Mr. O here. Um, my apologies about the Phantom Toll Booth. Uh, I recorded them over spring break and tried to upload them, and I guess they um, they didn't go all the way through on the time that I um, scheduled them to. Um, so I really apologize about that. Um, oh, and yeah, I'm trying something new, so we'll see if this recording device makes it more clear. Um, so I'm just trying something new. I'm going to be a scientist about it and listen to the recording afterwards and see what I think. Um, all right, so let's get back to it, what you've all been waiting for, the Phantom Toll Booth. Um, the last time, uh, the last video was Chapter 11 about Dr. Discord and Din. And Dr. Discord and the Din created all of these loud and harsh sounds um, and they did so as kind of like mad scientists mixing potions, mixing together um, solutions to create these uh, really unpleasant sounds. And at the very end of that chapter, Milo and Tok and the Humbug uh, were about to leave and they told Dr. Discord that they were going to be going to the Valley of Sound and Dr. Discord was very worried about that and he warned them about how terrible the experience was going to be. So that's where we'll pick up chapter 12, The Silent Valley. How agreeable and pleasant this valley is, thought Milo, as once again they bounced along the highway, with the humbug humming snatches of old songs to his own vast amusement, and Tuck sniffing contentedly at the, at the wind. I really can't see what Dr. Discord was so concerned about. There certainly couldn't be anything unpleasant at all about this road. And just as the thought crossed Milo's mind, they passed through a heavy stone gateway, and immediately everything was different. At first, it was difficult to tell just what had changed. It all looked the same, and it all smelled the same. But for some reason, nothing sounded the same. I wonder what's happened, said Milo. At least that's what he tried to say, for, although his lips moved, not a sound came out of his mouth. And suddenly, he realized what it was, for talk was not ticking any longer, and the humbug, although he was singing happily, was doing so in complete silence. The wind no longer rustled the leaves, the car no longer squeaked, and the insects no longer buzzed in the fields. Not the slightest thing could be heard, and it felt as if, in some mysterious way, a switch had been thrown, and all the sound in the world had been turned off at the same instant. The humbug, suddenly realizing what had happened, leaped to his feet in terror, and Tok worriedly checked to see if he was still keeping time. It was certainly a strange feeling to know that no matter how loudly or softly, you chatted or rattled or bumped. It all came out the same way as nothing. How dreadful, thought Milo as he slowed down the car. The three of them began to talk and shout at once with absolutely no result until, hardly noticing where they were going, they had driven into the middle of a large crowd of people marching along the road. Some were singing at the tops of their non-existent voices and others were carrying large signs, which proclaimed, Down with silence! All quiet is no diet! It's laudable to be audible! More sound for all! And one enormous banner stated simply, Hear, hear! Except for these, and the big brass cannon being pulled along behind, they all looked very much like the residents of any other small valley which you've never been to. When the car had stopped, one of them held up a placard which said, Welcome to the Valley of Sound. And the others cheered as loudly as possible, which was not very loud at all. Have you come to help us? asked another, stepping forward with his question. Please, added a third. Milo tried desperately to say who he was and where he was going, but with no success. As he did, four more placards announced, Look carefully, and we will tell you of our terrible misfortune. 
And while two of them held up a very large blackboard, a third, writing as fast as he could, explained why there was nothing but quiet in the Valley of Sound. At a place, he wrote, in the valley not far from here, where the echoes used to gather and the winds came, there is a great stone fortress, and in it lives the Sound Keeper, who rules this land. When the old king of wisdom drove the demons into the distant mountains, he appointed the Sound Keeper guardian of all sounds and noises, past, present, and future. For years, she ruled as a wise and beloved monarch, each morning at sunrise, releasing the day's new sounds, to be borne by the winds throughout the kingdom, and each night, at moonset, gathering in the old sounds to be cataloged and filed in the vast storage vaults below. The writer paused for a moment, shook his hand, wiped his brow, and then, since the blackboard was full, erased it completely and continued anew from the top. The soundkeeper was generous to a fault and provided us all with the sound, all the sound we could have possibly used, for singing as we worked, for bubbling pots of stew, for the chop of an axe and the crash of a tree, for the, the creak of a hinge and the hoot of an owl, for the squish of a shoe in the mud, and the friendly tapping of rain on the roof, and for the sweet music of pipes and the sharp snap of winter ice cracking on the ground. The writer paused again as a tear of longing rolled from cheek to lip with the sweet, salty taste of an old memory. And all these sounds, when once used, would be carefully placed in alphabetical order and neatly kept for future reference. Everyone lived in peace, and the valley flourished as the happy home of sound. But then, things began to change. Slowly at first, and then in a rush, more people came to settle here, and brought with them new ways and new sounds. Some beautiful, others not so. But everyone was so busy with the things that had to be done that they scarcely had time to listen at all. And as you know, a sound which is not heard disappears forever and is not to be found again. People laughed less and grumbled more, sang less and shouted more, and the sounds they that they made grew louder and uglier. It became difficult to hear even the birds or the breeze, and soon everyone stopped listening for them. The writer again cleared the blackboard as the humbug choked back a sob. And he continued writing. The sound keeper grew worried and disconsolate, which means unhappy. Each day there were fewer sounds to be collected, and most of those were hardly worth keeping. Many people thought it was the weather. Others blamed the moon. But the general consensus of opinion held that the trouble began at the time that rhyme and reason were banished. But no matter what the cause, no one knew what to do. Then one day, Dr. Discord appeared in the valley with his wagon of medicines and the bluish smoggy din. He made a thorough examination and promised to cure everyone of everything. And the soundkeeper let him try. He gave several bad tasting spoonfuls of medicine to every adult and child, and it worked but not as expected. For he cured everybody of everything except noise. The soundkeeper became furious. She chased him from the valley forever and then issued the following message. From this day forward, the valley of sound will be silent. Since sound is no longer appreciated, I hereby abolish it. Please return all unused amounts to the fortress immediately. And that's the way it's been ever since, he concluded sadly. There is nothing we can do to change it. And each day, new hardships are reported. A small man with his arms full of letters and messages pushed through the crowd 
and offered them to Milo. Milo took one which read, Dear Soundkeeper, We had a thunderstorm last week, and the thunder still hasn't arrived. How long should we wait? Yours truly, signed a friend. Then Milo took a telegraph which stated, Band concert, great success. When may we expect the music? Now you see, continued the writer, why you must help us attack the fortress and free the sound. What can I do? wrote Milo. You must visit the sound keeper and bring from the fortress one sound. No matter how small with which we will load our cannon, for if we can shoot the sound to the walls with the slightest noise, the walls will collapse and free the rest of the sounds. It won't be easy. The sound keeper is hard to deceive, but you must try. Milo thought for just a moment, and then, with a resolute, I shall, volunteered to go. Within a few minutes, he stood bravely at the fortress door. Knock, knock, he wrote neatly on a piece of paper, which he pushed under the crack. In a moment, the great portal swung open, and as it closed behind him, a gentle voice sang out. Right this way, I'm in the parlor. Can I talk now? cried Milo happily, hearing his voice once again. Yes, but only in here, she replied softly. Now, do come to the parlor. Milo walked slowly down the long hallway and into the little room where the sound keeper sat listening intently to an enormous radio with switches, dials, knobs, meters, and a speaker covering an entire wall, and which at the moment was playing absolutely nothing. Isn't it lovely? She sighed. It's my favorite program. Fifteen minutes of silence. And after that, there's a half hour of quiet. And then an interlude of lull. Why, did you notice that there are almost as many kinds of stillness as there are sounds? But sadly enough, no one pays any attention to them these days. Have you ever heard the wonderful silence just before the dawn? She inquired. Or the quiet and calm just after a storm. Or perhaps you know the silence when you haven't the answer to a question. Or the hush of a country road at night. Or the expectant pause in a room full of people when, everyone, when someone is just about to speak. Or, most beautiful of all, the moment after the door closes and you're all alone in the whole house. Each sound is different you know, and all very beautiful, if you listen carefully. As she spoke, the thousands of little bells and chimes which covered her from head to toe tinkled softly, and if, as if in reply, the telephone began to, re to ring. For someone who loves silence, she certainly talks a great deal, Milo thought to him himself. At one time I was able to listen to any sound made any place at any time the soundkeeper remarked, pointing towards the radio wall. But now I merely... Uh, pardon me, interrupted Milo as the phone continued to ring, but aren't you going to answer it? Oh no, not in the middle of the silent program, she replied and turned the silence up just a little louder. But it may be important, said Milo. Oh, not at all, she assured him. It's, it's only me. It gets so lonely around here, you see, with no sound to distribute or collect, that I call myself on the phone seven, eight times a day, just to see how I am. How are you? Milo asked politely. Not very well, I'm afraid. I, I, I seem to have a touch of static, she complained. But but what brings you here? Of course, you've, you've come to tour the vault. Well, they're usually open to the public only on Mondays from two to four, but since you've traveled so far, we'll make an exception. Follow me. She quickly bounced to her feet and, with a chorus of jingles and chimes and started down the hallway. Don't you just love jingles and chimes? I do, she answered quickly. Besides, they're very convenient, for I'm always getting lost in this big fortress and all I have to do is listen for them, and then I know exactly where I am. They entered a 
tiny cage-like elevator and traveled down for nearly a minute, stopping finally in an immense vault whose long lines of file drawers and storage bins stretched in all directions from where here began to where there ended, and from floor to ceiling. Every sound that's ever been made in history is kept right here, said the sound keeper, skipping down one of the corridors with Milo in hand. For instance, look right here. She opened one of the drawers and pulled out a small brown envelope. This is the exact tune George Washington, yes, that George Washington, whistled when he crossed the Delaware River on that icy night in 1777. Milo peered into the envelope and sure enough, that's exactly what it was. Well, but why do you collect them all? Milo asked as she closed the drawer. Well, if we didn't collect them, said the sound keeper as they continued to stroll through the vault, the air would be full of old sounds and noises bouncing around and bumping into things. It would be terribly confusing because you'd never know whether you were listening to an old sound or a new one. Besides, I do like to collect things and there are more sounds than almost anything else. Why, I have everything here from the buzz of a mosquito a million years ago to what your mother said to you this very morning. And if you come back here in two days, I'll tell you what she said to you tomorrow. It's really very simple. Let me show you. Say a word. Any word will do. Hello? Said Milo, for that was all he could think of. Now where do you think it went? The sound keeper asked with a smile. I don't know, said Milo, shrugging his shoulders. I always thought that uh, most people do. She hummed, peering down one of the corridors. Now, let me see. We find the cabinet with today's sounds. Ah, here it is. Then we look under G for greetings, then M for Milo, and here it is, already in its envelope. So you see, the whole system is quite automatic. It's a shame we hardly use it anymore. That's wonderful, gasped Milo. May I have one little sound as a souvenir? Certainly she said with pride, and then immediately thinking better of it, added, NOT! And don't try to take one, because it's strictly against the rules. Milo was crestfallen. He had no idea how to steal a sound, even the smallest one. For the soundkeeper always had at least one eye carefully focused on him. Now, let's look at the workshops she cried, whisking him through another door and into a large abandoned laboratory full of old pieces of equipment, all untended and rusting. This is where we used to invent sounds, she said wistfully. Do they have to be invented? asked Milo, who seemed surprised at almost everything she told him. I thought sounds just were. No one realizes how much trouble we go through to make them, she complained. Why, at one time, this shop was crowded and busy from morning to night. But how do you invent a sound? Milo inquired. Oh, that's very easy, she said. First, you must decide exactly what the sound looks like. For each sound has its own exact shape and size. Then you make some of them here in the shop. And you grind each one three times into an invisible powder. Throw a little of each into the air every time you need it. But I've never seen a sound, Milo said. You never see them out there, she said, waving her arm in the general direction of everywhere, except every once in a while on a very cold morning when the sound freezes. But I digress. In here, we see them all the time. Here, let me show you. She picked up a padded stick and struck a nearby bass drum six times. Now listen, six large, woolly, fluffy cotton balls, each about two feet across, rolled silently out onto the floor. You see, she said, putting some of them into a large grinder. Now, listen, and she took a pinch of the in almost invisible powder, threw it into the air with a boom, 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 boom. Do you know what a hand clap sounds like? Milo shook his head. Try it, she commanded. 
He clapped just once, and a single sheet of clean white paper fluttered to the floor. He tried it three more times, and three more sheets of paper did the very same thing. And then he applauded as fast as he could, and a great cascade of papers filled the air. Isn't that simple? And it's the same for all sound, she said. If you think about it, you'll know what each one looks like. Take laughter, for instance. She said, laughing, ha 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 brightly, and a thousand tiny bubbles, brightly colored bubbles, flew into the air and popped noiselessly. Or speech, she continued. Some of it is light and airy, some sharp and pointed. Uh, but most of it, I'm afraid, is just heavy and dull. How about music? asked Milo excitedly. Oh, right over here. We weave it in our looms. Symphonies are large, beautiful carpets with all the rhythms and melodies woven in. Concertos are like these tapestries. And all those other bolts of cloths are serenades, waltzes, overtures, rhapsodies. And we also have some of the songs that you often sing, she cried, holding up a handful of brightly colored handkerchiefs. She stopped for a moment and said sadly, We even had one section over there that did nothing but put the sound of the ocean into seashells. This one was such a happy place. Then why don't you make it, why don't you make sound for everyone now? shouted Milo, so eagerly that the sound keeper leaped back in surprise. Don't shout, young man! If there's one thing we need more of around here, it's less noise! Now, come with me, and I'll tell you all about it. And put that down immediately! Her last remark was directed toward Milo's efforts to stuff some of the large drum beats into his back pocket. They returned quickly to the parlor, and when the sound keeper had settled herself in a chair and carefully turned the radio to a special hour of hush, Milo asked his question once again in a somewhat lower voice. It doesn't make me happy to hold back the sounds, she began softly, for if we listen to them carefully, they can sometimes tell us things far better than words. But if that is so, asked Milo, and he had no doubt that it was, shouldn't you just release them? Never! she cried. They just use them to make horrible noises which are ugly to see and worse to hear. I have, I leave all that to Dr. Discord and that awful, awful din. But some noises are good noises, aren't they? He insisted. That may be true, she replied stubbornly. But if they won't make the sounds that I like, they won't make any. But, he started to say, and it got no further than that. For while he was about to say that he didn't think that it was quite fair, he suddenly discovered the way he would carry his little sound from the fortress. In the instant between saying the word and before it sailed off into the air, he had clamped his lips shut. And the word but was trapped in his mouth, all made, but not yet spoken. Well, I mustn't keep you all day, she said impatiently. Now, turn out your pockets so that I can see you didn't steal anything and you can be on your way. Milo turned out his pockets and when he had satisfied the sound keeper, he nodded mm -hmm. his farewell, for it would have been most impractical to say thank you or good afternoon. And with that and a closed mouth, Milo raced out the door. And that was chapter 12. Now, a valley where there is no sounds at all. I don't know about you, but that sounds positively dreadful. Now, outside, it's spring. Life is awakening. And there are so many different sounds now that you might not hear all of them unless you really stop Stop what you're doing and listen closely. And I encourage you to do that today on this beautiful day. We've had some pretty poor weather recently, um, but it's sunny today. The sky is blue. The birds are chirping here. And I know there's a lot of different kinds. I'm sure there are other sounds too that 
I will notice if I stop and listen carefully. So that's what I encourage you today to do today. It's like a listening point. Go outside, pick one location. Could be in a tree, maybe at the top of your fort or playground, underneath, um, in the shade, in the sun, wherever you want, your favorite place in your yard, front, back, side, whatever, and just listen. And I challenge you to listen until you hear at least 10 unique sounds. Not the same robin chirping 10 different times, not the same dog barking 10 times, but I encourage you to hear 10 different unique sounds. Maybe write them down. Maybe bring your journal and notebook and you can just make a list of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and listen. And then at the very end, I'd be curious to know how you feel after sitting still, pausing in nature, and just listening. You might find that it helps to close your eyes. You can kind of follow the direction of noise because noise does have a direction. You can hear where the sound comes from. All right, that's what I have for you today for the Phantom Toll Booth. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day. Until then, stay healthy, stay safe. I miss you all.